Uh, today we'll be talking about a, a topic that's uh, certainly near and dear to my heart, but I think every gastroenterologist would agree that this is probably the single most important thing that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, whether it's in the office or in our endoscopy units, um, colon cancer. And the, you know, the topic uh, for today is treatment and prevention. Uh, as most are probably aware, the, you know, the, the, the key aspect of all this is prevention. Uh, is, you know, what I often tell my patients in the office is getting at the problem before it becomes the problem. And through today's conversation, through today's presentation, we'll go through, um, you know, sort of the, the details and of what screening in, involved, um, dispelling some of the myths around certain types of screening. Um, and that's where I'll rely on the, some of the audience to have some questions for me at the end in terms of, um, you know, things they may have heard or things they may have read or things they're not quite sure of as it relates to screening or some of the tests that I'll mention for screening. Um, and no question is too silly or too small. Uh, we know there's a lot of sort of sensitive topics in GI when we see patients in the office, uh, whether it's related to, uh, you know, symptoms that, that the patients experience um, or, you know, questions as it relates to medications they take. So I always tell patients, whatever's on your mind, spit it out. And, you know, the, the goal here is to Leave, leave here knowing a, a few more things about colon cancer prevention and treatment than when we first started. So um, again, today, uh, colon cancer prevention and treatment. We, we know uh, at the end of February and March is colon cancer awareness month. So good timing in terms of setting up this particular uh, talk. Um, and hopefully we uh, lead into uh, March, um, getting everyone who is due for some form of colon cancer screening caught up uh, with the uh, the recommendations, and obviously there's been somewhat newer recommendations a few years ago that we'll, uh, again, briefly discuss. So this is a little schematic about, you know, that sort of just clearly shows and outlines um, the different types of cancer that out there, the prevalence of each cancer. Uh, and when we try to, you know, when we see patients in the office and we're, we sit down with them and, you know, the primary care physicians have sent them to us to discuss colon cancer screening, a, a very common uh, argument that may come up from the patient's perspective is, doc, I'm fine. I'm pooping fine. I don't need any testing. Well, one of the first things we'll mention is that, you know, colon cancer is not a rare cancer. It's a extremely common cancer. It's the third most common cancer in men and women um, in this country. Um, prostate and breast are uh, number one for both men and women. Lung cancer coming in second and colorectal cancer uh, coming in at three. So, when, you know, when we're sitting here, uh, you know, bringing patients in or, you know, patients getting referred from their primary care doctors to discuss screening. We're not talking about some rare cancer that doesn't affect anyone. We're talking about the third most common cancer that is highly preventable through a, a variety of screening options that are available to, uh, to each individual. Uh, so it's important to keep in mind that, you know, you're trying to do whatever you can to avoid um, the big, you know, dangerous cancers that are out there. Now, there are, you know, some rare, very uncommon cancers that afflict patients and uh, typically is a combination of some bad luck and some bad genes. Uh, but we know that, uh, you know, if we can do our part to tackle the, the, the common ones, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help our odds. Um, so in general, colon cancer, again, affects uh, a good amount of patients. Approximately 150,000 patients each year uh, are diagnosed with colon cancer here in the United States. Uh, so again, that is no small amount. Uh, and about uh, 52,000 people or so will die every year from colon cancer in this country. Um, and so, you know, the government, uh, you know, over the last several decades has gone to valiant efforts to try to get patients screened for this particular uh, cancer. And the screening measures that they've put in place have, have been successful in trying to get uh, everybody screened. Now, we're not anywhere near the goals that have been set, you know, sought out. There are currently goals uh, set forth in the country to try to get at least 80% of patients who are due for screen, you know, some form of colon cancer screening screened by the age of 20, uh, by the uh, year of 2030. Um, approximately right now, only about two thirds of patients are getting screened appropriately. So there's still um, a big percentage of patients that are due for some form of colon cancer screening that are not quite there yet. Um, and these screening measures that have been put in place by the, by, you know, by uh, the government and the 
governing health bodies that make these you know, general recommendations have led to the incidence of colon cancer, uh, CRC refers to colon cancer, just for future reference. Uh, the incidence of colon cancer has been coming down over the course of the last several decades, but that decrease has slowed down. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're just, you know, working in a, a downward trajectory. It's again, there's a slow trend down, but it seems like that trend may be leveling off. Um, and we'll talk on the next slide of, you know, how, why that may be slowing down a little bit, which patient population uh, are we seeing more, you know, colon cancer? Uh, a brief comment just on the survival rates for colon cancer. Uh, the United States has one of the highest survival rates for colon cancer across the entire world. And that has to do in, uh, primarily uh, due to the screening measures that have been put in place. Uh, in conjunction with a lot of the treatment modalities that are now available, be it the different types of surgical techniques that are done by our surgeons or the, um, the newer chemotherapy medications and immunotherapy that is now available for the management of colon cancer. Um, you can see here you know, as, a, as a graph showing the different types of cancer and how they have, um, you know, uh, the death related, uh, the deaths attributed to each particular cancer and how they've changed over the years. You can see this little green line here, if you can see it, that is on the left side in males and the right side in females. Green line shows colon cancer, again, slowly trending down, but you don't, you see, again, it's not a sharp decline. It, it seems to be leveling off, especially over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Now, why may that be the case? We know that overall colon cancer is headed on the way down across the country. It's actually headed, you know, uh, on the way up across the United States, where we're seeing younger and younger patients being uh, uh, diagnosed with colon cancer. Now it's becoming the leading cause of cancer-related deaths in men and uh, women, uh, you know, before the age of 50. Um, and there's a lot, you know, a lot of different uh, sort of reasons why that may be happening. Number one, uh, we know that there may be a delay in the referral system. Um, several young patients, uh, when you look at most young patients that come to our office, they don't have a primary care doctor. I know, you know, patients in their 20s and 30s tend to feel immortal. They feel as they may not need to see a doctor. Uh, so they don't typically have someone that they follow with on an annual basis. So that referral to a specialist like a GI, um, like a gastroenterologist, may not come from a primary. It may come from an urgent care visit that they had and they decided to describe a, you know, a certain gastrointestinal symptom they had. Or if they visit an emergency room for some acute abdominal pain and the emergency room physician told them, hey, go see a GI doctor. Now, it's not to say that every young individual in their 20s and 30s and, and 40s doesn't have a primary care physician. They certainly do. But when they see those primary care physicians, they may not be comfortable sharing some of the information, their symptoms uh, um, that they're experiencing at home, whether they're scared or embarrassed or just, you know, may not be uh, aware of how important a symptom it is. Um, an additional part of all this is, you know, as it relates to symptoms, is a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms tend to, in, in most patients, whether they're 20 years old or 80 years old, um, we know a lot of patients often will attribute their symptoms to something uh, sort of more benign, uh, right? It, patients all the time come in and they say they see blood in their stool and they say, oh, it's probably hemorrhoids. And that's one of the many reasons why when uh, young patients are diagnosed with colorectal cancer, um, you know, when you look back on uh, what symptoms they were experiencing and what they, you know, how they interpreted those symptoms themselves, um, they said that, you know, they would have some rectal bleeding and uh, they thought it was just hemorrhoidal bleeding. Now, again, this isn't just uh, the responsibility of the patient. This often uh, you know, happens uh, when patients see and sit down with their physicians, whether it's a primary care physician, an urgent care physician, uh, even a gastroenterologist. There have been gastroenterologists uh, that, uh, you know, may chalk up one's uh, blood in the stool to hemorrhoids. I remember about five years ago, I had a patient who was in her late teens, 18 or 19, who had rectal bleeding and had hemorrhoids on exam. So we treated, you know, with a certain steroid cream. She came back two months later, uh, tried a different uh, steroid suppository for hemorrhoids. And then um, came back three months later, ongoing symptoms. And we said, okay, let's do a colonoscopy. And she had, you know, uh, a polyp in her bottom portion of her colon that was extremely ulcerated and precancerous uh, that was the size of a golf ball. And that was causing all the bleeding. So it happens to all of us where we, 
it's very easy sometimes to attribute everything to something more benign, like a um, in, the, in the case of you know, rectal bleeding, a, a hemorrhoid. Uh, but we see patients who come in and they'll have abdominal pain or bloating, and they chalk it up to either stress or uh, you know lactose intolerance or again something less serious. But uh, you know we often tell our patients that uh, you know you have to be able to you know you have to listen to your body and you know listen to what it's trying to tell you and then relay that to the physician who's in front of you, whether, whether that's a urgent care doc, an ER doc, or primary care physician or you know, specialist. Um, one additional aspect as to why colon cancer is rising in young adults is lack of insurance. We see that all the time where younger patients uh, have insurance issues in terms of getting in uh, in the office to see a, a specialist. Um, so again, there's a lot of different reasons why uh, there's a delay in diagnosis in these young adults. Now, you know, the reasons why we're seeing younger and younger patients um, with colon cancer, obviously the same risk factors that affect everyone um, are at play. Um, you know, typically here's a list of uh, a lot of the most common um, uh, risk factors associated with colon cancer. And I'm sure you understand that uh, a lot of these risk factors don't just apply to colon cancer. They apply to uh, multiple other cancers. Uh, tobacco use is, is associated with at least 10 different cancers out there, one of them being colon cancer. Uh, obesity. Uh, we know that the obesity epidemic that has hit the, the country in the last couple decades has been associated with a rise, uh, equal rise in uh, a variety of different malignancies, one of them being colon cancer. Uh, we know that the effect of obesity and what it does to in inflammation within the body releasing of certain proteins within the body, what it does to certain uh, hormone levels and what those hormone levels may uh, do to uh, causing or predisposing someone to developing cancerous or precancerous changes in their body. Uh, these are, you know, uh, ongoing risk factors. Uh, sedentary lifestyle, we know, and one common thing I'll say in the office is that, you know, sitting is the new smoking nowadays. We know that uh, sedentary lifestyle has been associated with more and more um, uh, uh, colon cancer. Diet. I think this is the big one, in my opinion, that is uh, has to do with why we're seeing a, the younger generation dealing with more and more colon cancer than they ever have before. If you look at our diet here in the United States over the last few decades, it has changed dramatically. Uh, the amount of fats um, within our diet, the amount of red meat within our diet. You know, red meat intake should ideally be no more than you know 500 grams uh, a week, which equates to about maybe 16 to 18 ounces of red meat a week. Um, I've had patients who eat a ribeye steak every other day. Um, so you know it's certainly something that is uh, again not only specific to the United States. If you look at uh, Europe, there's probably a McDonald's on every street corner nowadays. So you know things have changed over time. Um, but you know the the diet that's always been high in fats and red meat is now being supplemented by a bunch of additives um, and ultra processed foods that have really taken over even the healthiest of granola bars. Now, if you look at the back of the uh, ingredients have, you know, uh, the back of the label have ingredients that you can't even pronounce. Uh, and you couple all that with a low fiber diet, which we know fiber plays a big part in good colon health, anything from helping bowels move, uh, you know, bowel movements uh, and regularity to helping enrich the gut microbiome. It's been shown that patients who have a higher fiber diet um, tend to um, have a more rich microbiome and that rich microbiome uh, is one uh, unique feature that may help minimize one's risk of um, not only colon cancer, but a variety of different uh, uh, maladies. I think 10, 15, maybe a little bit earlier than that, I mean, 10, 15 years from now, you'll see uh, more and more uh, evidence of uh, the microbiome and the, the different, you know, healthy bacteria that live in that microbiome, how it plays a part, not only in GI disease, but a variety of other diseases, whether it's uh, neurologic, psychiatric. Uh, so uh, more to come regarding the microbiome and how that may be affected by uh, our diet. Uh, history of inflammatory bowel disease. We know patients who have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are at a little bit higher risk than the average Joe of developing colon cancer. Uh, and uh, equally important, and that will be, again, when we look at future screening options, stool testing versus colonoscopy, you know, why certain options are not, you know, indicated in certain patient populations.
uh, excessive alcohol consumption. We know that excessive alcohol consumption uh, may be associated with certain uh, turning on of certain uh, genes, and those genes are, are expressed at higher levels in patients with colon cancer. Um, hereditary risk factors. We know that not all colon cancer is um, is due to diet and lifestyle and smoking and obesity. Uh, we see perfectly healthy 30-year-old marathon runners who eat salad all day who get colon cancer. These are um, so that, you know, those particular unfortunate patients uh, uh, did nothing wrong from a lifestyle perspective. We just know that there are certain genes uh, that are involved you know, in colon cancer. But that is a small percentage of all colon cancer cases that are out there. Um, patients are often under the impression that um, one common misconception that we have to dispel in the office is that it's not purely genetic. Uh, that there's a variety of risk factors involved. And again, before we talk a little bit about the microbiome and how dysbiosis or that dysregulation of that microbiome through the different things that can occur in the body may be, at, uh, may be a significant risk factor for the development of colon cancer. So signs and symptoms. Um, you know, besides this list, you know, we see obviously patients who don't have a single symptom and they have colon cancer. So the take home point from this slide should be don't wait until you have a symptom to get evaluated. Again, that's a very common uh, argument that we'll have uh, not between patients, but you know, when, when we walk into the office and you see the patient standing by the door ready to leave before even the conversation starts and they say, doc, I'm, I'm pooping fine. I don't want to hear what you're selling. Uh, realize that you don't need to have a symptom to have a colon polyp or a, you know, or colon cancer. So very common signs and symptoms that we'll, we'll come across. Uh, blood in the stool. We know blood in the stool can be due to a variety of, uh, for you know, variety of reasons. Anything from hemorrhoids to polyps, the inflammation in the colon, suggesting colitis or Crohn's disease. Obviously, things like colon cancer. Uh, abdominal pain or bloating. We know that uh, abdominal discomfort, uh, no matter how acute or chronic, can be potentially be a sign of something more serious like colon cancer. So we typically recommend if. Uh, someone has some new onset uh, abdominal pain or bloating of a short duration, meaning if it, you know, if it starts uh, and lasts a day or two or a week, we typically suggest seeing what the primary care physician or urgent care doc has to say. Most cases, it's usually something self-limited, whether, again, it's something infectious, stress-related, food poisoning. But again, if it's lasting weeks to months to years, you can't keep blaming stress. You can't keep blaming um, stomach bug, uh, if all of a sudden, you know, you're six months out and you're still dealing with these symptoms. So uh, again, a very common symptom that often gets attributed to something less serious. A change in stool caliber, a uh, change in stool caliber refers to a uh, stool that looks thinner or flatter. We often ask patients if their stool looks um, thin as a pencil or as flat as a ribbon. A change in the stool consistency, where stool isn't as formed, and here you see a, a graph. This is the Bristol stool chart with the different types of stool, um, the characteristics in terms of their shape and consistency. Uh, they can put this uh, picture on a mug for you on a lot of you know Amazon and Etsy shops. So if you ever want to gift someone a fun mug, this is a nice way to do it. Um, unintentional weight loss. We know that patients who are not trying to lose weight, when weight starts coming off by itself, that more often than not, there's something structurally wrong with the gastrointestinal tract that um, could be causing weight loss. Um, weight gain, typically not the case. Uh, and again, there's a few exceptions, but we oftentimes see patients come in and say, doc, I've gained a bunch of weight. I'm not digesting my food appropriately. I think I have colon cancer. Doesn't quite work that way with regards to colon cancer. Now, again, there's rare conditions out there where patients can have you know extremely large growths growing within their abdomen. But as it relates to colon cancer, weight gain typically doesn't, you know, is not a, a feature of, of colon cancer. Uh, fatigue and weakness. Uh, we know any sort of chronic condition, whether it's cancer or infl in the inflammatory condition, can cause some degree of fatigue or weakness. And in the setting, of, you know, with regards to colon cancer, iron deficiency, anemia, or having low blood counts or low hemoglobin counts um, uh, will obviously cause some degree of fatigue or weakness. Uh, but anytime, you know, you have blood work done, whether again, it's an urgent care or by a primary care doctor or your GYN, and there's a history of iron deficiency anemia, that is considered an alarm sign that warrants further evaluation 
And typically we want to rule out any sort of gastrointestinal source um, through endoscopic testing. So how does cancer start? We know, how does colon cancer start? We know that the majority of colon cancers, about 95% of colon cancers, don't start out of nowhere. They usually start off as a polyp. And a polyp is a little growth in the lining of the colon here that uh, over time can turn into something more serious. Um, polyps themselves, the majority of them are usually benign, meaning that this tissue itself is not cancerous. But we know there's a wide variety of polyps that can arise within the colon and over a several year period. Common question that comes up often in the office is, doc, I had polyps last year and you had recommended the colonoscopy be done in five years. Why can't we do it more frequently? I'm afraid that I may develop colon cancer. Well, when a polyp is identified and subsequently removed by a gastroenterologist via colonoscopy, the assumption is that that polyp is gone and that it's not there anymore. And that should a new polyp arise, that it's not going to turn into colon cancer overnight. Um, and so, again, going from a little polyp to cancer is a several-year um, process. Now, there are different types of colon polyps, um, adenomatous polyps, sessile serrated polyps, hyperplastic polyps. The majority of colon cancers usually arise from an adenomatous polyp. Now, it's important to know and sort of get familiarized with some of these words because you'll you'll come across your own colonoscopy report at some day, and you'll, I'm sure you'll have the you know the biopsy, the pathology report as well. So it's good to know what types of polyps um, were seen and removed on your colonoscopy because they're not all the same. Some have higher risk features and put you at a higher risk in terms of um, surveillance and keep you know how close an eye we have to keep on you in terms of subsequent colonoscopy. And others are very, very benign polyps that even if you left them in there could theoretically cause no issue. Hyperplastic polyps, especially if they're in the very, very lower portion of the colon here in the rectum, don't really increase one's risk of colon cancer. Now, hyperplastic polyps on the right side of the colon, this is the right side, this is the left side, this is the right side. Uh, hyperplastic polyps on the right side of the colon cancer may put people at a slightly higher risk. Uh, so again, different types of polyps out there. And again, going from polyps to cancer, A, is not an overnight process, and B, it's a gradual methodical process. Now, where there's changes that occur at the tissue level for a variety of reasons, whether it's the carcinogens that may be in food um, or smoking um, or the inflammatory markers and, and things we said regarding inflammation as it relates to obesity, and then just time or age. Um, so there's sort of this cascade, uh, not cascade, but general progression of going from a small polyp to something more serious. And the reason why colon cancer uh, prevention and screening is so important is that, you know, the goal of any screening isn't just to find this, you know, at the end. It's not just to find cancer. It's to find it way over here when it's still just a tiny little polyp. Because if we can find it in this stage and treat it appropriately, then you minimize the risk of it ever going down towards something down in this way, you know, down this end of the spectrum. Um, and, you know, I often tell patients, again, one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll bring up is, you know, females will get mammograms for breast cancer screening. And mammograms can tell you if there's cancer there or not. Colonoscopies, on the other hand, with regards to colon cancer screening, um, can get at the problem way before it becomes a problem. Okay, they don't tell you, hey, you have a colon cancer or no colon cancer. Um, certainly, yes, we can find a colon cancer, but you know the, the more important part when we put patients through screening when they come in you know, on time is to find these growths again when they're still just you know small little polyps. And so again, one of the many reasons why colon cancer screening is, is important. Now, how do we diagnose colon polyps and colon cancer? Now, again, the colon is the large intestine, the large intestine is the colon. Those two words are interchangeable. And the colon is an organ that is approximately five feet long in size. You can see that here. Here's the rectum, the sigmoid colon, the descending colon, transverse colon, um, ascending colon, and cecum, with the appendix being here. And this is the small intestine. Um, people often ask in the office, uh, what about the small intestine? What do we do about this here? How do we check this area? Small intestine cancer or small bowel cancer is an extremely uncommon cancer. It's sort of at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to GI cancers in terms of prevalence. So there's no formal screening for small intestinal cancer. So the goal of any colon cancer screening is obviously to focus on the colon uh, or large intestine. 
And the best way to evaluate um, the colon is to do something we call a colonoscopy, which is a long, thin, flexible tube with a camera at the end of it that is maneuvered and propelled to the end of the colon or the beginning of the colon in this instance, with the goal of looking at the lining of the colon because it does have a camera with a light source and being able to identify polyps, these little growths that arise in the top layer of the colon, in the superficial layer of the colon wall. And people often ask, well, how do you remove these polyps? The goal is to remove them right then and there. And fortunately, these scopes that we use have inner working channels where wires and catheters can be uh, brought from the outside in through the middle portion of the scope and uh, they come out the outer sort of tip of the scope and again here's an example of a snare which is a wire that is lassos the polyp and then we close that snare and we sort of guillotine that polyp off and that's one way of many uh, of how polyps can be removed and here are some pictures of uh, you know, from colonoscopies, various colonoscopies of various types of polyps uh, that we come across on a daily basis. Uh, again, polyps are not uncommon. Uh, we find polyps approximately, you know, 30% of the time in females and about 50% of the time in males. So they're very, very common. This morning, I think I did three colonoscopies. All three patients had polyps. Two of them had four polyps. One patient had three polyps. So there's not, you know, they're the goal is to find them and take them out before they become a bigger issue. Most polyps are usually very small um, in this particular range here. This would be approximately uh, four to five millimeters or so in size, about as big as like the tip of a pen. Uh, whereas this might be a little bit bigger and they can take on different shapes and size. You can see um, the ones that can sometimes be more dangerous are the flat ones, which can often go missed. Um, especially if, you know, if, if the physician isn't taking their time looking at the lining of the colon thoroughly. Um, here's a picture of another type of polyp. Now, this polyp is not blue in color, it's white, but uh, this was uh, for the sake of, I guess, this picture and prior to removal of this polyp, the gastroenterologist in injected a blue dye underneath just to highlight how that indeed is a polyp. Without that blue dye, I would suspect that most of you seeing this picture right now would not be able to see that polyp. Because again, it sort of blends in with uh, the, the background mucosa or lining of the colon. This is what we, uh, if you were to remove this and send it off to a pathology lab, uh, would likely come back as a serrated polyp. These polyps that um, can sort of go missed a little bit more easily. And again, some polyps can be flat uh, like so. Um, some can have a, sort of a wide base and others can have a little stalk that comes. And you'd be surprised how all these polyps, no matter how big or small they are, this one is about five millimeters or so in size, this may be a little over an inch big. None of these really will, would probably cause symptoms. Maybe this one caused a little blood in the stool, but uh, people often ask, Doc, I'm not getting any you know, obstructive symptoms. I'm not having any pain. Therefore, I should not have any polyps. Well, uh, none of these polyps here should be causing symptoms in the majority of patients. Again, maybe this one a little bit. Um, but again, it's something that you shouldn't be waiting until a symptom arises to get checked. Um, and again, the goal is to find a polyp when it's this small and take it out. This being, again, one of the ways we talked about removing it via colonoscopy. And this is through a snare that guillotines that polyp off. And the goal is to take this out and not leave it in there. Because if you leave it in there, you can develop any one of these things here on, on the, on the uh, next to it. These four images here show different forms of colon cancer or different, you know, sort of shapes of colon cancer. Um, you know, this and this and then, you know, pretty much all four of these probably cause some degree of symptoms where there was a thinner caliber stool. You can see here how the aperture of the colon is diminished. The, the lumen, the, the opening is a lot smaller. So I'm sure this particular patient probably had thinner stools at one point, as did this patient. Uh, this patient may have had some blood in the stool at, at one point. Um, but we know that, again, uh, I'm sure any one of these patients could have had zero symptoms. They just decided to show up for the colonoscopy and it was just, you know, incidentally diagnosed. So again, the goal is to find them when they're just small little polyps to avoid bigger headaches down the road. So colon cancer screening. Um, it was always thought that, you know, people would turn 50, you'd have to your 50th birthday bash, you have that big party, and then your primary doctor would tell you to go see a gastroenterologist. 
approximately three years ago, they changed the national guidelines in this country to recommend colon cancer screening to be started at age 45. Because um, the thought has, you know, not the thought, they, they would look at the evidence and they, they've, you know, it's been shown that younger and younger patients are being diagnosed with colon cancer. And so to get a jump start on those patients, getting them screened earlier um, would, again, help minimize the incidence of new cases of colon cancer in younger patients. So the average risk individual. Now, what does average risk individual mean? Average risk individual refers to someone with no symptoms and no family history of colon cancer. They just turned 45, they're feeling fine, no gastrointestinal complaints, um, and they show up to their uh, primary care doctor and those primary care doctors will say, all right, go see a, go see a GI doctor. Maybe one of the things they tell. Now, in terms of screening average risk individuals, the strongest evidence out there is to continue screening between the ages of 45 and 75. Because we know that continuing some form of screening between those ages does help minimize the incidence of colon cancer and death from colon cancer. There's more and more evidence now to uh, suggest that continued screening between 75 and 85 can be beneficial in the right patient. Now, I have seen patients in their 50s and 60s who are not even good candidates for an initial colonoscopy because of some underlying condition, whether it's having significant heart disease where they have pacemakers or defibrillators uh, or significant COPD and are on home oxygen or someone battling stage four breast cancer where their life expectancy may not be more than six months to a year. Um, so again, it's not just a number, uh, you know, we, we want to assess, you know, especially in patients between 75 and 85, you know, we always take the whole person into account, their prior history, how many colonoscopies have they had over the past uh, several years? How are they doing in regards to their other medical problems? Are they, uh, are they physically active? Is their performance status good? Or are they just bed bound all day? And in those particular patients, they may not be as good a candidate to continue any, any form of screening. So the average risk individual now, again, it's not 50, it's 45. That's been the case now for the last two and a half to three years. Some younger patients in their mid to late 40s may be hearing about it for the first time at their uh, you know, primary care physician's uh, office visit. There's still, unfortunately, a very small percentage of patients between 45 and 50 who are actually getting screened. I think the numbers right now are around 20 to 25% of all patients in their um, mid to late 40s are actually getting a colonoscopy. So uh, primarily, A, it want, you know, the many reasons for this is, um, A, um, there's a backlog of seeing to a GI physician, right? Because all of a sudden now you have patients who, in this five-year span, um, uh, didn't know they needed something, and all of a sudden they need something. Um and B, even you know, there may be other you know, physicians out there who are not aware of the most recent uh, uh, changes in guidelines or patients in their mid late 40s may still not have a primary care physician. So they really aren't even aware that they should be getting uh, screening from 45 to 49. So again, that's something, quote unquote, something you know, fairly new in the last few years that has changed the, the dynamics of you know, how we do, uh, who, we, who we're seeing in the office. Above average risk individuals, are patients who have a family history of colon cancer or a personal history of IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. So patients who have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease are at a little, at a little higher risk of developing colon cancer. So those patients may need to be screened a little bit earlier. Um, and with regards to a, a family history of colon cancer, in general, if patients have a first degree relative diagnosed with colon cancer before the age of 60, they're considered higher risk or above average risk. That colonoscopy should ideally be done at age 40 or 10 years before the age of diagnosis. So say a patient has, uh, a patient's mother had colon cancer at the age of 47, they should ideally get their colonoscopy at age 37. Um, and then there are patients who have multiple family members with colon cancer. And that's where the discussion with the GI doctor becomes helpful and figuring out when would be the ideal time to um, start looking. Now, we'll go through a variety of screening options that are available to the average risk individual, but for the above average risk individual, someone with colitis or Crohn's, or someone with a family history of colon cancer, the other options that are out there in terms of colon cancer screening, the stool tests in particular, 
are typically not indicated. And they would, you know, would be doing a disservice to the patient and giving them sort of a false sense of, you know, mission accomplished if they proceed through stool testing when in fact they should be having a different form of screening, primarily colonoscopy. And then there are obviously patients who have a variety of different types of genetic syndromes that can predispose uh, patients to a variety of cancers of different organs. Um, and that's where a detailed family history becomes very important with your primary care physician to determine if you need to see a GI doctor because of any potential risk of having colon cancer as part of that genetic syndrome. Now, uh, just a brief word on a diagnostic colonoscopy. I, I couldn't find a slide really to put it, so I put it on here. You know, in terms of colon cancer screening, screening refers to, again, no one with symptoms. They just show up. They turn to a certain age or do for something. Colonoscopy may be an option for them. Uh, a diagnostic colonoscopy refers to a colonoscopy that's performed for a particular reason, meaning there's a symptom that needs to be evaluated, there's abnormal blood work like anemia that needs to be evaluated, or there's a, a stool test that turned up to be positive that needs to be um, uh, evaluated. Now, the reason I bring this up is something that often you know, we come in, uh, we encounter in the office is obviously this is good old healthcare in the United States and it's it's pricey, it's pricier probably than anywhere else in the world. And uh, unfortunately in this country, diagnostic colonoscopies are not, you know, uh, they come out of your deductible. They're not uh, considered preventative. You know, uh, if you have blood in the stool, you cannot just get a colonoscopy covered by your insurance. It would have to come out of your deductible. So again, one very important aspect to note, um, and again, comes from this sort of the, Sort of the financial nightmare of, of healthcare in this country, and one of the many reasons why uh, some patients' symptoms may go uh, undiagnosed or un, you know, uh, may go you know, undiagnosed for some, quite some time is because of the cost that may be associated with again a diagnostic colonoscopy if someone has symptoms that warrant evaluation. Again, that's different from screening. So what is the best screening test, right? You turn age, you turn 45 or 46 or, you know, and then your doctor says you need to get checked for colon cancer. Now there's, you know, uh, different types of tests out there. Obviously we've talked a little bit about the colonoscopy and that's considered a one stage test, meaning uh, everything gets done at that particular visit. And then there are two stage tests where um, the, the primary ones being stool tests or a virtual colonoscopy. And we'll briefly touch on that as well where should the, any one of these be positive, a colonoscopy would be needed as a follow-up for further evaluation. So colonoscopy, what is it, right? This is a picture of a colonoscope. This is the, the, the instrument that we use. This is the, um, this part right here is the part that is inserted into the patient. Again, the colon is approximately five uh, to six feet long. This, this long, thin, flexible tube, which is about a centimeter wide, is about 160 to 180 centimeters long. Um, the scope itself has angulation controls, uh, so it's not just a big garden hose, as some people may think it is. It has these uh, angulation controls that help navigate the flexible tip of the scope towards the, um, the finish line, the appendix, the appendix area, the cecum. Um, it is a short-duration procedure. The actual procedure itself is on average about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, typically, patients will be expected to be at their procedure an hour before their procedure, and the recovery time on average is approximately 30 minutes. And the majority of cases are usually done under some form of intravenous sedation. Intravenous propofol is a very quick acting medication that is used by anesthesiologists for these ideal, you know, for these short duration procedures. And the propofol that is typically used nowadays is again, uh, very quick on, very quick off. It doesn't have sort of the long lasting lingering side effects that older sedatives used to use. Uh, older sedatives used to have people leaving a little loopy and little sort of, you know, gave them that you know, hangover feeling uh, all day long. Uh, the stuff that is used nowadays is uh, a lot more pleasant and, and again, ideal for these short duration procedures. And again, the recovery time is approximately, um, you know, 30 to 40 minutes on average. This is the best test at finding polyps. And like we said, we can find them, we can remove them uh, right at the time of the test. A very, very, very small percentage of patients may have a polyp that is so large that it may require either a subsequent colonoscopy a few months later 
or even surgery. We've come across patients who have very, very large polyps that can't be removed through a colonoscopy, and that's where we'll refer them to see a surgeon to discuss removal of that part of the colon. Uh, again, it doesn't happen often. Maybe once every few months, there's someone who has a polyp that large. But again, uh, the vast majority of patients, uh, again, the polyps are removed right then and there. Now, what are the disadvantages? Um, the nightmare that is usually associated with colonoscopy is the bowel preparation. And that has gotten better over the years. There are a wide variety of bowel preparations that are available out on the market that are, have a you know better taste to them than what they used to give 20, 30, 40 years ago. They are less volume than what they used to be. It used to be traditionally that everyone would get a gallon of uh, salt water you know, type of solution that tasted horrible and everyone hated you for it. Uh, nowadays, again, the volume is a little bit less and there's even certain types of uh, bowel preparations that are pills only. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of those, those tend to cause more nausea and vomiting, I think, than most um, of the liquid solutions. Another disadvantage that becomes a challenge sometimes is that uh, most facilities and um, practices that perform this procedure uh, often re require that the patient have a chaperone to drive the patient home after the procedure. Yes, you feel fine walking, uh, you know, leaving and walking the, out of the office, but legally you cannot just jump in your car uh, and go down Route 17 after having, you know, sedation, uh, propofol running through your veins. Uh, so we know that can be a challenge in terms of finding a friend or a family member, someone who's available to take off of work or leave work to be able to drive them home after. So again, that's something that uh, can be a, a challenge in terms of completing a colonoscopy. And, and we advise patients to when they, you know, when they see their primary care physician and the primary care physician is suggesting going to see a GI doctor for uh, an eventual colonoscopy, that you raise some of these concerns regarding, um, uh, you know, setting up of any potential, you know, uh, procedure. Uh, if you have no friends or family in the area, if everyone's out of state and um, you have very unfriendly neighbors who aren't willing to help out, um, that may be a very big challenge where the colonoscopy may not be the best test for you to, to go through. Uh, and most places don't ha have, a, have a policy that do not allow for taxis, Ubers, uh, you know, people who are strangers to you to be able to drive you home. And because, again, it is an invasive procedure, uh, there are risks associated with it. We know that there's a risk of infection, infections related to the processing of the equipment, uh, bleeding risk, that's about 3% of the time. Um, perforation means making a hole in the lining of the colon with the tip of the scope. That happens about 1 in 10,000 cases. Uh, and the rare case, something like that were to happen, it may need surgery to fix. And then obviously anesthesia is known to lower one's blood pressure, heart rate, and oxygen level. All three of those are typically monitored continuously throughout the duration of the test. Now, there are uh, other options for the average risk individual, stool tests. There's the FIT test. And what may, many of you may know already is the Cologuard test that's heavily advertised all over television. The stool test, uh, the FIT test is a little kit that gets mailed to you, or you pick it up at a lab rather, and um, you submit a little stool sample and you put it into a little uh, container. And if normal, it's done annually. If abnormal, it needs to be followed up by a colonoscopy. Uh, the Cologuard stool test looks for small amounts of blood and DNA in the stool that may suggest the possibility of polyps and cancer. It does have a fairly high false positive and false negative rate, so it's not a perfect test. We know that if the Cologuard is normal, uh, then it can just be repeated every three years. If abnormal, uh, ideally should be followed up by a colonoscopy within six months. Um, if one is having symptoms, again, to reiterate, if somebody is having any one of the symptoms I mentioned before, blood and stool, abdominal pain, change in stool caliber, consistency, then please do not hang your hat on any one of these stool tests. These, are, these give patients a false sense of hope. Um, with symptoms, a diagnostic colonoscopy would be indicated. Again, the stool tests are there. They're easier. It's uh, obviously more convenient. Um, most of them are uh, uh, cheap, especially the fit test. The disadvantage, though, they're not as good as the colonoscopy, and they have to be done more frequently. Uh, the Cologuard test is covered by most commercial insurances in Medicare, but there are some insurances that will charge patients $500 to $700 for a Cologuard stool test. So be careful about uh, and, and obviously ensure that your insurance is okay with the Cologuard should you decide to go down that path. We mentioned before about the false positives that are associated with the Cologuard use. 
And then again, if you are of a certain patient population, if you are above average risk, um, if you have a family history of colon cancer or a personal history of colitis or Crohn's, then these would not be options for you. A brief word on virtual colonoscopy, which is uh, also referred to as CT colonography. When this came out 25 years or so ago, the thought was that it was going to replace colonoscopy and uh, nothing else would need to be done for a colon cancer screening. And, and little did we know, you know, not little did we know, we, you know, we found out pretty quickly that um, uh, it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Because what it is, is you, you still have to do the bowel cleanse. Uh, you go into a radiology place, they put air into your colon while you're awake, there's no sedation. So there's obviously discomfort that is felt as they use air to pump up the colon and inflate the colon to sh the, you know, better reveal the lining of the colon and the folds of the colon. Um, and if it's abnormal, then you still need a colonoscopy. And again, it's not the greatest test in that it really doesn't miss, uh, it really doesn't catch polyps that are less than six millimeters or so in size. So it does a very poor job of finding very, very small polyps. Um, so as quickly as it came on as something new and very, you know, tech savvy, uh, it sort of has gone to the wayside. Um, this here is an image that I saw on a radiology website somewhere that I came across where they wanted to sort of sell people on, on virtual colonoscopy compared to a colonoscopy. Um, again, the traditional colonoscopy does not last 45 to 60 minutes. We said it's a 50, 15 minute procedure. Um, you know, the, the claim here was, okay, you got five, five feet of tubing in you versus just a little thing on the inside. Um, I realized that, again, the air that they're pumping in gives you more discomfort than any tube would. Um, lack of sedation versus sedation. Again, you can see here how they try to sell a CT colonography. Um, but again, it really hasn't taken off. And it really is, um, you know, like a tier three option at this point. I usually tell patients, if you're not up for the colonoscopy, then do the annual fit test or the Cologuard. Um, we sometimes will rely on virtual colonoscopies after a colonoscopy. Say um, someone undergoes a colonoscopy and we can't finish the colonoscopy. It doesn't happen often, maybe one to 2% of the time. But we know that if sometimes patients have a very twisty colon or a stricture or narrowed portion of the colon, that will sometimes right after their colonoscopy, send them up to the radiology department to do a CT colonography to at least look at the remaining portion of the colon that we couldn't effectively visualize during the colonoscopy. But again, it's something that really I would not recommend um, uh, doing as a primary modality. You'll probably see it uh, on commercials of, you know, Princeton Longevity and those uh, packages that they put together for patients where you go through a whole day of testing and usually a virtual colonoscopy is part of all that. And uh, please don't do this as your form of colon cancer screening. Uh, a comment on surveillance. Um, we know that in patients who have polyps and they're removed, that based on your personal history, your family history, any symptoms you may be experiencing, and your prior colonoscopy findings will determine when your next colonoscopy should be done. Um, we oftentimes see patients who come in and they say, doc, my last doctor told me I was always gonna be on the three-year plan or five-year plan. There's no real three-year or five-year plan. A lot of it is based on what the prior findings were. So it's always good practice to keep your records from prior testing, right? Most patients will change primary care doctors over time. <clears throat> Most patients will change GI doctors over a several year period. Um, so it's important to keep those records, both colonoscopy reports and biopsy reports, in order to determine, all right, how close an eye do we have to really keep on you, you know, from now until you're 75 or even beyond 85. Again, just one quick slide on colon cancer treatment before we go to the questions. Um, you know, when someone is diagnosed with colon cancer, the first question that often comes up in the recovery area is, what stage am I? And stage uh, cannot be determined just by colonoscopy alone. So typically, if we see a growth on a colonoscopy that is suspicious for colon cancer, we certainly biopsy it and wait for those biopsies to return. But the next step is obtaining some form of imaging, whether it's a CT scan, an MRI, or a PET scan, to determine the stage, meaning where is this cancer? Is it outside the colon? Does it involve any local lymph nodes? Does it involve any lymph nodes further away? Or does it involve any distant organs like the liver or the lungs? And based on all that information, we can then you know, try to determine uh, what the best course of options may be, uh, whether it's just surgery alone or a combination of chemotherapy and surgery, or again, if in the setting of, of uh, rectal cancer, you know, is there a course of radiation that's one? So um, 
you know, they, and this unfortunately can be a whole talk in and of itself in terms of colon cancer treatment. That's why I kept it sort of uh, light in, on this particular talk and uh, feel free to come back and talk, have, give another talk on colon cancer treatment. But again, the, the take home point is uh, the big take home point being that March and the next month is colon cancer awareness month that 45 is now the new 50. And so you should get screened and get screened by um, any one of the modalities we mentioned. Um, again, the rule of thumb is the best test is the one that gets done. Okay. Very, very important. Um, realize though, uh, one additional thing I forgot to mention before, some patients are very adamant about against any colonoscopy, even if their stool tests were to be positive. So that is certainly something that you should, that conversation you should have. And that concern should be voiced to your, whether against primary care doctor or GI doctor that. If we say get a colonoscopy or we recommend a colonoscopy and you say, no, I'll do a stool test, you should be aware that if a stool test is positive, that that would warrant a, a subsequent colonoscopy. And there are patients who say, no, I won't even do it then. So the question becomes, do we really need to even do a stool test for, uh, you know, screening if you're not going to, you know, do that next step to see what's truly wrong? Um, so again, that should be part of the discussion. And those concerns should be voiced to, to, to your physician. Uh, and again, equally important in all this, especially in young patients, whether you're 20, 25, 30, or someone a little bit older, if you have any symptoms, discuss them with your doc. There's no symptom that's too small um, that uh, you shouldn't be able to share with any of your GI, any of your doctors. This is uh, our our group here at uh, Valley Medical Group, uh, our GI division, um, and uh, our hub, our our uh, center uh, is here in Paramus, uh, right in the same parking lot as the new hospital that's about to open up in a couple months. But we also have offices in Mawa, Wayne, and Montvale. Um, and you see here uh, our seven GI doctors, Dr. Art Antler, Dr. Chakavadia, Dr. Michael Herman, Dr. Anish Patel, John Pinto, myself, and Dr. Michael Ramin are, again, uh, seven GI docs here in uh, Valley Medical Group. Um, a brief note on the Fast Track program. Now, for average risk individuals between the ages of 45 to 75, who do not have any gastrointestinal symptoms and aren't under the care of a GI doctor, and have never had a, you know, may have not had a colonoscopy in 10 years, we have a, a very successful fast track program where you can bypass that initial consultation. Um, and, you know, you call that number and, you know, go through a series of questions from, with the person who picks up that number, uh, that phone. And if it's determined that um, uh, you meet the criteria and there's no high risk features or symptoms, then you can be uh, scheduled directly without the need for the office visit. I often tell patients that that office visit becomes important because you want to know a little bit, obviously, about the doctor, the different types of preps that he or she may use. Um, so it's important to, again, uh, get screened. And if this helps more people get to that appointment, uh, we're, we're all for it as well. And again, it's been shown to be a very effective, very successful program. This is a quick picture of our um, our hospital here in Paramus. Uh, it's beautiful inside and out. We've been on the, on the tour lately. So... Uh, um, uh, you'll be amazed at what it looks like inside. Um, and so now I'll take any uh, questions that uh, anyone has. So here I see a question. Have, uh, I was going to say we have a lot of questions in the chat. Okay, I'll go through them. Okay. So um, someone asked, are polyps painful to remove? Polyps come from the top layer of the colon. So there's no nerve endings in that particular part that would cause pain. We oftentimes have patients who prefer to do their colonoscopy without any sedation at all. And there is no pain when a polyp is removed. Um, because again, it comes from that top mucosal layer um, of, the, of the colon. Uh, there's another question here. If a 50 or 60 year old patient has heart issues, valve replacement, pacemaker, how are they screened for colon cancer? Patients with cardiac comorbidities, we obviously look to see how they're doing uh, with regard to the cardiac comorbidities. We have certainly done plenty of colonoscopies in patients who have pacemakers, valve replacements, uh, atrial fibrillation, a history of stents in the heart. A lot of it is based on how well their cardiac condition is controlled at the time. Again, that's very, very important. Typically, for with regards to screening, one important, uh, and thank you for the question. This is actually an important question that I forgot to mention. So if someone is due for a colonoscopy, just for screening, no symptoms, they say, hey, I'm due. If they've had a cardiac or neurological event within the past one year, so if they had a heart attack, stroke, a stent put in, the recommendation by our GI societies is that they wait one year 
to undergo any sort of elective GI testing. So say a person had a, a stent put in their uh, coronary artery um, in March of 2023, um, and they come to us in January saying, I'm ready for my colonoscopy now, we would say, no, wait till March of 2024. It's been shown that in patients who wait one year until that event, whether it's a stroke, um, a heart attack, stent placement, that patients can safely then undergo, assuming their condition is adequately controlled by the cardiologist. Um, but the screening options are still the same in patients who have cardiac comorbidities. We can take it on a case-by-case -case basis based on how well they're doing um, with regards to their other conditions. Um, let's see here, There's a, a, I'll read this uh, comment here. Thank you for clarifying what is used for anesthesia. I've had three colonoscopies so far, and each time there have been benign small polyps, but I've been nervous about the repeated anesthesia. I keep praying the prep is going to be easier one of these days. I was hoping you were going to say uh, there is a magic pill now, but the pill option sounds problematic. Yes. Unfortunately, the way our plumbing was built, uh, I don't see any one pill coming into our lives magically making everything go away easily. Uh, the preps and the liquids that are out there have gotten better. What works a lot, what works very, very well for my patients is Typically, the week of the test, if they just start eating a little bit lighter earlier in the week and even do something as light as a very simple over-the-counter tasteless Miralax a couple times, two, three times earlier in the week, that just get, wakes up the colon a little bit and, and sort of reminds the colon that there's work to be done soon. And that usually leads to less pain, less cramping, less nausea, less vomiting. Um, and so um, the short answer is no magic pill yet. Uh, my personal opinion regarding the pill prep is that I've seen more patients vomit from it than actually keep it down okay. Um, but again, there's a large number of different laxatives that, that are out there. Um, you know, sit down with your GI and tell them, hey, what do you prefer in terms of either taste or volume? And again, they should be able to work with you to try to make it a little bit more pleasant for you. Um, if one is diagnosed with IBS most of their adult life, are they at a higher risk for colon cancer? We know that an IBS or irritable bowel is a functional hypersensitivity of the intestine that does not put patients at an increased risk of irritable bowel. Uh, and I'm sorry, an increased risk of colon cancer. Now, that being said, IBS is a diagnosis that has somewhat been easily slapped onto patients over the years without the appropriate initial testing. Typically, if someone has issues with their bowels, abdominal pain, bloating, there should be some degree of blood and stool testing done initially to exclude things like anemia, celiac disease, abnormal thyroid function, stool tests looking for inflammation in the colon, stool tests looking for blood in the colon. Um, but if you have a formal diagno diagnosis of an irritable bowel, that does not put you at an increased risk of colon cancer. Uh, it may make you feel like you have colon cancer. We know IBS symptoms when they're uncontrolled can really make people feel crummy. Um, but it's something that um, doesn't necessarily put you at a higher risk of colon cancer. Can anyone who is under 45 do the fast track or is it only for 45 to 75? Again, the fast track, pro good question. 40, the fast track program is for screening, colon cancer screening, meaning you're due for screening, meaning no symptoms and no family history. So if you're, if you're looking to get a colonoscopy before the age of 45, it's either you have symptoms that need evaluation or abnormal blood work that needs evaluation or there's a family history that needs to get sort of deciphered. Um, and then therefore the fast track program would not necessarily apply uh, to those particular patients. Um, someone asked if they they missed the first part of the meeting. Yes, there will be a, the recording should be available and uh, I think you guys can uh, um, test to that. Someone asked that our colonoscopies, why are colonoscopies not necessary for those over 75 years old? Not true. Uh, there's more and more evidence to suggest that uh, continued screening between 75 and 85 um, is uh, helpful in the right patient. Again, we have to see each individual person, uh, their comorbidities, how they're doing with regards to the other medical conditions, what their last colonoscopies have showed. Um, you know, and someone who's maybe had four or five colonoscopies over the years that were all perfectly normal without a single polyp, and all of a sudden they're 80, it may not be worthwhile having that patient repeat a colonoscopy, whereas someone who's had a bunch of precancerous polyps all throughout their colonoscopies and is now 80 and doing well, that person may be a, a slightly better candidate. Uh, will you do a colonoscopy without sedation? Yes, colonoscopies can be done without sedation. Realize there is a little bit more uh, discomfort than obviously someone under sedation. Um, uh, 
um, you know, the sedation that used to be used many years ago, like you mentioned in your in your question, kept patients a little bit lighter and sort of looking at the screen a little bit. Um, the propofol that is given, again, tends to have sort of a quick on and quick off. So again, some patients, um, not some, most patients, again, will be asleep throughout most of it. But again, if there's a request to be a little bit lighter so you can get a free movie out of it, uh, the anesthesiologist will work um, with you. How frequently should a person repeat the colonoscopy if nothing was found? In the average risk individual with no polyps and no family history of colon cancer who undergoes a colonoscopy and it, that is normal, colonoscopy should be repeated once every 10 years. If um, polyps are found, then based on the number, type, and size of polyps, we make the determination as to when that colonoscopy should be repeated. And I think that's all I see on questions, if anyone has.